question was if there was any changes um, to the requirements for release of the, the chemical composition of the disbursements. And as far as I know, I don't know of any. Um, but, but you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually work with EPA's Office of Emergency Management <coughs> who have written a proposed rule, and I don't recall that specific issue. It's always a pr business confidentiality, <coughs> proprietary, and the only way we breach that with uh, with NALCO was because of the huge amount of 9500 being used. They also wanted to change a minor uh, component of their formulation, and in order to to get approval to do that, since it was now no longer the list, the exact listed product, they had to uh, provide you know a public domain list of the components. But I don't know for sure. I, I but I know the people that do, and I could provide that to Emily. How many studies were actually used to uh, determine the changes in the regulation uh, before you actually made those changes? And, uh, and my second question is, um, based on all the data that was gathered during MC252, what uh, did any of that data, was any of that data used to reformulate the regulation? Right, so um, if I can par paraphrase the question, so it's, so what, what sort of, Prior information was used, either Deepwater Horizon or other, that um, it helped us uh, in crafting the proposed rule. Right. What study? So yeah. So, so, um, so I can mostly speak to the toxicology aspects to it, but um, some some perspective. So things that uh, drove the uh, proposed new rule. One of them is. On the, on the toxicology side was that the methodologies being used in the, in the main product, which was fuel oil number two, is really 1980 science. And there has been not just, say, any specific studies, but uh, 20 years of oil advancement in petroleum science. And uh, so, we wanted as an agency to um, have the current regulations reflect that. One of the issues that arose during Deepwater Horizon was the very limited um, numbers of species that we had uh, listing information on. So we've added the, uh, uh, it's an echinoderm, we added an additional uh, species to that. The whole, in crafting the revised toxicity part, there's always the balance between a burden on the, um, on the manufacturers and uh, providing enough information for the on-scene coordinator. And so a lot of them are small businesses that might be affected by the regulation, so there was that balancing. I can tell you that you know, internally uh, we are now sort of binning up the 80,000 comments into some themes and then those, what you see as, um, as you all said, what, what actually comes out in the final rule may not be what you have seen. We're going to consider it, um, uh, how it might impact uh, the listing of dispersants uh, and, you know, other sort of technical issues. So, so you guys are not going to do an interim final, you're going to do a final rule based on the comments, so you're going to be able to answer all the comments? Um, you know, that's... I don't know if you know the answer to that. Will there be another? I, I understand there's another round of public comment. I had thought that there was going to be another round of public contact, um, comment, but my, um, someone, the person who reviewed the notes at EPA said that there would not be. Okay. So, so I'm, I actually have two different sources of information. He would know. This is Gregory yeah. Wilson, who is the Right. So, so I would say there probably won't be. At this point, um, although I, I originally understood that there would be. Yeah, I, that's how. So my second question okay. was, um, did you use any of the toxicity data, any of the efficacy data, any of the data that was collected during the water or <coughs> any decisions on yeah, yeah, the abso product use? And other yeah, things? absolutely. So um, most of the, the so the question is, is so what from what did we learn in Deepwater Horizon and how is that 
uh, helping us in terms of crafting the proposed rule. And um, of course the data that our agency collected was core to that. Like we've been trying to get this uh, baffle flask test changed um, for a decade, frankly. Uh, so that data um, and also some subsequent uh, studies looking at dispersibility, also comparing it to like onset uh, values, correlating it with uh, oil chemical properties. So that was incorporated on the toxicity side. Um, we uh, gained uh, sort of a baseline with Louisiana crude oil that was uh, we used in our judgment to develop these benchmarks of listing. For example, you know, would the toxicity of dispersant need to be greater than 10 parts per million? Uh, so that was a core driver. Um, one of the, the kind of the key rationales, and I'm not sure if it's clear in the, in the Federal Register notice, is that the idea is, is to, um, with the proposed new rule, is to um, eventually have those uh, chemicals that aren't very efficacious or are highly or the most highly toxic uh, would be no longer listed and and we think that is a good I mean, I, I'm, I'm a scientist I don't I'm not a policy person I'm not authorized to talk about policy but I can tell you in a general con concept that um, the agency's thinking has been to really try to move one move the science uh, and at least in the toxicology and efficacy area, move that forward at least up to current state of the science. And then two, uh, uh, hopefully um, that ultimately which would be chemicals listed and available for all your use would be um, less toxic and more efficacious. And that's the, I'm not sure if that was clear in the, mm -hmm. in the proposed rule or not. Okay. Um, one of the other questions I think that a lot of people probably ask okay. is what is the relative toxicity of dispersants versus household chemicals that you use every day, like Don just washed your right. so, like that. Are you guys looking at publishing anything that relates to those types of Yeah, so um, so the question is is how do uh, chemo how does the toxicity of uh, oil spill dispersant uh, products uh, compare to some standard uh, products like what we use to clean oil, oil glassware. Don works pretty good. Um, I you probably shouldn't say that, but um, but anyway. So actually, uh, a few folks, my colleagues, um, I think in a, a, um, a work for the petroleum industry, published a recent study looking at. Um, you know, I was actually a peer reviewer on it, but looking at the relative toxicity of of a number of dis dispersant products, and then. Uh, things like dishwashing soap and uh, you know uh, laundry detergents and things like that, and it, and they were all within the realm of similar toxicity. But the issue there, and, and I tried to bring this out in my my presentation, is that the assays that are generally used to benchmark relative toxicity, including, are 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 based on very acute you know four day tests. And this has just sort of been a, a principle of, of what's called acute toxicity testing. So on an acute level, they can show similar uh, toxicity as, uh, as uh, consumer, many consumer products. The longer term uh, effects are, um, are, are frankly are not being evaluated and are, I, I wouldn't say unknown, I would say uncertain. I also wanted to make a point um, that uh, the, uh, there is monitoring requirements in the regulations for dispersants. It may not be in the particular law, but there is. And, and the, the other thing that EPA does is publish, they publish the, the products that are used. They don't, pu they don't publish the amounts that can be used. They leave that up to the OSC to make that decision. Yeah. That's why that's not in there. So, yeah. Um, and that's why we use as much uh, still during the spill Yeah, so because so they, they have to be done safely. So that's up to the OSC and the RT to make that decision whether this persons are being used and are they being used safely. Yep, understood. So the just to capture it on film here, the what the gentleman 
uh, comment was that um, the, the, the current in, in subpart J rule uh, doesn't specify what allowable volumes and that's, that's determined by the unseen coordinator, um, which is true. Thank you for, for those, handling those questions and for asking those great questions and voicing those comments, those are excellent. Um, I think we have time for one more question from the audience and then uh, we're gonna have to wrap things up so that you all can move on with your agenda. Do you have one more question from someone here in the room? I got one uh, uh, funny comment for you guys to leave you with something uh, funny. So we're, so uh, EP, the EPA reference oil at one time, uh, we had a repository of uh, Louisiana crude oil. Well, that was exhausted in all the testing done for Deepwater Horizon. So now we're, we're coming up for the proposed rule of what would be the new reference oils. And we wanted to have a lighter crude and a heavier crude. But we tried... The, one of the most tested oils in the world has been Alaska North Slope crude oil. So we have tried to purchase uh, like five barrels and we have been told, and I think you think it's funny that we will sell you a tanker full, but you cannot get a barrel. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny. Um, so we're still uh, wrestling with what the new reference oils will be. That's <laughs> true. Um, okay, I think that we're going to have to wrap up, but if you could just thank all of our guest speakers one more time. And I would just like to thank you all again for uh, carving out this hour and 20 minutes from your agenda uh, to have us share this science with you. I really appreciate it. And I know how packed these meetings are, so it means a lot. And all of this came out from a conversation I had with Jeff Dozad about a year ago, and then talking with some of you over the past year as well about things that you're interested in. So thank you again.